Good evening and welcome to uh, the 20, Fall 2023 Architecture Engaged um, Lecture Series. I'm Valerie Gustin, I'm Associate Professor. I'll be the moderator and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our uh, speaker this evening. Um, I have to, of course, always begin with our sponsor recognition. Uh, the Spring um, 2023 Lecture Series is provided by generous support of the USC Thomas J. Barak and Jin uh, D. Wong Annual Lectures Fund. So starting from the top, uh, Julia Gamalina is dedicated to the built environment and the visibility and advancement of the women who shape it. She is founder and editor-in-chief of Madam Architect, a digital magazine and media startup that celebrates these extraordinary practitioners. Trained as an architect herself, Julia stays engaged in professional practice as an associate principal and business development director at INEAD, where she is, focuses on the educational, cultural, and healthcare markets nationally. In the same vein, Julia is a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute, teaching a graduate level professional practice seminar on the history and practices of the profession. In 2021, Julia was named one of Apartment Therapy's design change makers and one of Commercial Observer's top young professionals. In 2019, she also received a special citation from AIA New York for her work with Madam Architect. Her writing has been featured in Fast Company, A Woman's Thing, Metropolis Magazine, Architizer, and The Architect's Newspaper. Her speaking engagements include lectures at Harvard, Columbia, Yale, UPenn, Pratt, the IE School of Architecture and Design, Georgia Tech, and uh, USC Tonight. Very excited about that. Uh, she served as a guest critic at uh, Cornell, AAP, Columbia, and the School of Visual Arts, and was opening keynote speaker at AIA 2022 in Chicago, where she interviewed AIA's new CEO, Lakeisha Woods. Julia received her Bachelor of Architecture at Cornell University, graduating with the Charles Goodwin Sands Memorial Medal for Exceptional Merit in the thesis in, in the thesis of architecture. She was born in Siberia and is based in New York City. So I guess this weather feels right at home, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and so without further ado, let's give a warm USC welcome uh, to Julia Gamalina. Hey, thank you, Val. Thank you so much to all of you for having me, for um, going with the flow. Um, I'm here today to talk about Madam Architect. Um, for those that aren't familiar, it's a website I started almost five years ago, um, featuring all kinds of women in the industry. Um, and what I'll talk to you about today is how and why it got started, how it's evolved, and who we featured. And then I'll end with focusing on a few specific case studies, um, sort, sort of longer stories of women that we featured, just to show you, like, the possibilities of pivots in the industry, the possibilities of what you can do with your architectural education, um, and just possibilities of what you can do in the world at large. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. Um, I am from Siberia. Uh, I feel like I am responsible for this cold weather that I brought with me on <laughs> my arrival here. Um, but I lived in Siberia until I was eight. Um, fun fact, I actually left the day before Putin took office as prime minister. And I don't think that was a coincidence that our exit visas had that date for us to leave. <laughs> very, very glad. Um, that was, so we immigrated to Toronto, Canada. Um, we loved it there. For anyone that hasn't been to Toronto, I highly recommend. And the reason we actually ended up leaving Toronto is because even though it's it can be a little bit easier for professional immigrants to come to Canada, it's a lot harder for them to actually find work in their professions there, or at least my parents found it so. Um, my mom's a PhD mathematician, my dad's a structural engineer, and my mom worked on the retail floor at a clothing store at eight months pregnant with my brother, and my dad was a delivery guy. Um, they eventually ended up volunteering and finding jobs, but ultimately they said, you know, we need to find real work. Um, so that's how we came to Colorado. Uh, we moved to Colorado Springs only because that's where my dad got a job there. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Colorado Springs, it is a very funny bubble um, in terms of various political views. And my dad would often joke that he's an atheist and a pacifist, but all of his structural commissions would come from the church and the military. Uh, so. <laughs> 
Um, they are not no longer in Colorado Springs. My dad is now a structural engineer in DC. My mom's in Pennsylvania. My brother's a student at UVA actually in um, computer science. And I say all of this, I give you all this context because um, I ended up in architecture, studying architecture because of so many factors that related to us moving around. Um, first of all, just moving around and obviously noticing new environments. It's, it was actually a bigger culture shock for me to move to Colorado than it was to move from Novosibirsk to Toronto because Toronto and Novosibirsk are both extremely cosmopolitan. There is a metro system, a subway, um, you could walk everywhere. I mean, sometimes in Siberia, I would cross country ski uh, to get to places, but um, the scale and sort of the way you exist in the city was very similar. And then obviously in Colorado, very much car centric. I don't need to explain to you all about what that's like. Um, but I remember my mother and I walked out into the street uh, when we first arrived in our apartment building and to go for a walk with my brother in a stroller and people on the street were like, you guys know that the sidewalk is going to end in like two minutes, right? There's nowhere to walk. And we were like, where are we? What is this place? Um, so anyway, I noticed all of that. I drew a lot. Um, I was very visual, um, was very interested in languages and politics and society and culture and architecture just seemed to combine everything. But one other note, and I actually get asked a lot of questions from international students on visas and everything. Um, I think my parents actually pushed me to a professional um, degree and a professional education, knowing that it would be much easier to get visas this way since we were so, um, uh, what's the word, nomadic, uh, if you will. And my parents definitely knew I wasn't going to be a doctor and they didn't think I would be a lawyer. So they suggested architecture. And I think, again, having that professional degree and being able to you know, get a visa easily, work in different places easily was very much a part of that. Um, so I that's what I studied, um, studied at Cornell um, and loved my education there. I think um, studying architecture as all of you are today, you know, it involves so many different parts of your brain and you're writing, you're presenting, you're creating visual content. Um, it's, you know, a very, very intellectually stimulating field. And then once I graduated and moved to New York City, um, side note, I have to say that I think all I wanted moving around so much was to be in New York. I learned English on so many movies that took place in New York, one of them being One Fine Day with Michelle Pfeiffer and George Clooney for, I don't know how many of you know this movie, if you don't highly recommend, but Michelle Pfeiffer plays an architect, George Clooney plays a journalist, and I'm basically their baby. Uh, <laughs> and the, I think my career was decided right there and then when I saw this movie and uh, picked up some you know English phrases from it. But I did end up in New York City like I wanted, but what I found was that professional practice um, was very different, obviously, than, than everything that you're doing in school. I think you tend to focus on sort of one aspect of what you're learning and being prepared to do, which um, maybe doesn't happen in offices everywhere or the roles you have everywhere, but it did for me. Um, and the other thing I noticed is this built-in system of mentorship. Uh, was gone. And what I mean by mentorship is all through school and, and university, you have your professors, right? You have your professors that are your guides that answer all kinds of questions for you. And one thing my mom said to me when we were immigrating so much is, um, you know, Julia, I'm your mom. Of course, I'm going to guide you and support you in every way that I can. But I'm also new to these countries. I've never taken the SATs. I've never written a cover letter in English. Um, so I'm not your best resource for these kinds of things. And I really think you should uh, build good relationships with your teacher. So that's what I did. Um, I was that student, you know, waiting outside of the classroom always. And right when I graduated and moved to the city, um, you know, again, that system isn't quite there anymore. It can be with some larger firms. I think some larger firms, first of all, have a lot of people all at different levels. They have internal mentorship programs, but I was selecting smaller, more boutique offices where there were very few people. So of course, you're not going to like make it known in the office that you want to be here for six more months and then move on. Um, and I also found that the offices I was selecting that tended to be a little bit smaller uh, didn't have very many women there. Um, and if they were there, they were typically in roles like business or marketing um, and not architectural design. I think the first firm, I think I was one of three women out of 25 people, which is this office where this photo was, take, was taken. Um, anyway, so 
I really took it upon myself to um, recreate the system of mentorship because that is something that served me really well my whole life um, in both my academic and you know professional career, but also just personally. I think you know as a new kid in school a lot, or as someone that doesn't know the language or the culture or the customs, I was definitely asking a lot of questions and trying to make connections with people wherever I could. Um, so this is how, you know, the seed of Madam Architect was planted. I um, joined a few organizations in the city that focused on women and architecture and bridging together practice in the academy. Um, found a few really great mentors, um, some of whom, you know, would spend hours with me in their offices just talking about life and um, professional practice, etc. And one key thing, too, for me was that I was always a writer. I wrote a lot in school. I would write for fun. Um, and I knew that this was a part of my career that I wanted to exercise, but I didn't know how. Um, I wanted to write for magazines or I knew that you could write for magazines. I saw some alumni from Cornell that had graduated before me that were doing that, but I didn't know how you did that, you know, without having a portfolio of that kind of um, written work. And so when I was uh, talking to my mentors, I thought, you know, it would be amazing as if I interviewed them because this is how I could continue to get this mentorship. This is how I could write a little bit and exercise that part of my brain. And also how wonderful would it be to share this um, because I know I'm not the only young person and the only woman that has the questions that I do. And this is how everything started. I, there's an organization called Architects in New York City that was founded by one of my former professors um, to that really take advantage of everything your professors have to have to offer while you're here, because they are the ones that will help propel you into the professional world. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really glad I, I did that and, you know, showed up to things that my professors were hosting. So um, I wrote for this organization's blog. I started by interviewing Vivian Lee, um, who was a principal at the time who, you know, had made it quote unquote in the field. And I wanted to know how she got there and how she got past all of the hurdles that we often hear about and all of the challenges that women face. And after having interviewed her, I thought what would be really interesting is interview is to interview somebody in the trenches, not somebody who's made it and is looking back with rose colored glasses, if you will, but somebody who's about like in real time starting a firm or in real time starting a family. And so that's what Irina was doing um, in the white shirt. She had just started her teaching career and she just had her daughter. So we talked about that. Um, then again, I interviewed Sarah LaPergolo, a partner at Seldorf Architects, a very similar style to Vivian, just how did you get to where you are? What recommendations do you have for people that would like to also one day have a significant position within architecture? And then I interviewed Jenny again, um, or not again, but I interviewed Jenny again for the reason being she was starting her own firm and also starting a family simultaneously. And we talked about, you know, what she was doing in the moment for that. Um, after I did those four interviews, the blog I was writing for invited me to do a guest editorship um, where they wanted me to curate a group of 12 women to do interviews with. Um, I think the editor in chief at the time was doing it on top of her full time job and, you know, wanted to lighten the load a little bit. So she was looking for guest editors to take it on for three months at a time. So I did that and I actually ended up reaching out to 16 women instead of 12 because I knew that maybe some would say no, maybe the timing wouldn't work out. But everybody said yes, which was my clue number one, that this was something that maybe was pretty needed um, or would be a good thing to do. And we, we did the, um, the guest editorship. I had conducted all of the interviews. I had edited all of them. We were ready to launch. And I was thinking, you know, what should I call this? Um, the series and this was in 2016 2017 when this was starting to come together and what was happening in the United States at the time and what was on everyone's minds the presidential election and madam president and so I think just being in that like zeitgeist at the time I was I remember sitting in my rolling office chair and I was like oh yeah madam architect um kind of from the madam president vein we called it madam architect we published an interview every Thursday and I started to get comments like um, from my peers in the industry that were like, Thursdays are my favorite day now because a Madam Architect interview comes out. And I think the interviews just got so much positive response and so much excitement. I saw people sharing them all the time that I didn't want to stop this work when the guest, the guest editorship was done. And I knew that um, the architecture community didn't want this to end either. So that's when Madam Architect became its own entity, its own website, um, and this was in May, May 3rd of 2018 is when I launched, um, when I launched it as its own thing. 
So our five year anniversary is coming up and actually we just reached a milestone. We'll be announcing it on Wednesday, but the first to hear um, is we've now featured over 400 women on the website. So we're gonna do a big social media celebration, Madam Architect 400, and definitely invite all of you to help us post and share your favorite interviews and et cetera. And I'll talk about how you can do that um, at the end. So this is what Madam Architect looks like today. Um, you know, we call it a digital magazine and a media startup, but it's called so many different things. People call it a platform, uh, a magazine, just a pure magazine. Um, and really what I think Madam Architect is, is a compilation of perspectives in the industry and all in all different ways. So I'll talk about our different content verticals, um, but really our goal is to showcase women's voices and in general, just all the different voices in the industry in general, um, in different ways. I know that sounds really vague, but you'll know what I mean um, as I go further along. So the, the core of Madam Architects are the feature interviews, which I'm sure is um, the content type that you're most familiar with. This is where we ask women about their career, about their lives. Um, we don't, we really try hard not to ask things like, what is it like to be a woman in architecture? Because I think at this point we know, we know what the issues are. Um, and what I want, and also we also, even though Madam Architect obviously is a platform dedicated for women, so we're creating a specific space separately for women, I also didn't want women to feel that they were being separated in some way as like their own type within architecture. I wanted um, the people that we interviewed to feel like they were architects and they were being interviewed as experts and as architects. Um, and so we just ask about, you know, how they got into architecture, what they do within architecture, what they want to do for the world. And we keep the questions, um, you know, really about their successes and about them. Um, so with over 400 women now on the website, um, our goal, I would say, really is variety. We want to showcase as many different possibilities in this industry for a career as possible. And so, whereas at the beginning, we would start with folks like Deborah Burke, who again have, you know, quote unquote, made it, um, who obviously have had significant impact, very successful careers. Um, but then also folks like Samantha Josephat, who are just emerging, who are starting their firms, starting their practices, and, you know, on their way to make significant impact. I mean, she has already, but I think you know what I mean. Um, and then whereas Samantha, who I had just shown, was starting her own firm, Elise Sams, who was a peer of mine at Cornell, she was, you know, going through the process of licensure within a firm in Florida, and we wanted to share that perspective as well. And then before we had the Next Generation column, which features students, uh, which I'll talk about later, before we had that, we did feature a student very early on as part of our feature interviews. Um, again, just to have that perspective of someone about to enter the world and what are they facing, what are they thinking about, what do they want in the future, and um, that was always an important perspective for us to share. And then from there, from featuring people at kind of different points in their career, we decided to really focus on featuring people with different focuses within the industry. So Jenny Sabin, for those of you familiar with her work, really focuses on material technologies, new fabrication methods, um, and versus somebody like Lorena Del Rio, whose PhD was in plastics, using plastics as a material and, um, uh, as, and how materials in general can sort of convey very different things within architecture. We interviewed Siobhan Rockcastle, who um, just trained as an architect, but then got her PhD in daylighting design and is now a daylighting consultant and professor. So again, a very, very specific focus within the field um, and a very interesting and needed one. We interviewed Eben Falconer here on the very right, who was the business development director of BIG to talk about the business side of architecture. Kimberly Dowdell, who needs no introduction. Um, she has done everything. She's worked in public policy. She was worked in real estate. She's worked in architecture as an architect. She's working now in architecture and marketing. And so obviously, in, speaking about focus and someone that has had so many different ones at different points of her career, we definitely wanted her early um, up on the website. Tammy Hausman is a PR consultant and helps architects tell their stories. Sydney Franklin, at the time of the interview, was a journalist and a fellow at the New York Times for real estate. Gabby Bullock, you know her, um, she's the director of global diversity 
um, for Perkins and Will. And so obviously we talked about initiatives that she was spearheading there. Jen, um, again, speaking of uh, like a multitude of perspectives, is trained as an engineer, also as an architect, has worked for the Port Authority in New York, um, dealing with all kinds of transportation systems in the city, and then worked for Bureau Happel Engineering. Now she's working at SpaceX. So again, uh, things you can do with an architectural training are pretty limitless. Margaret Jankowski is a landscape architect. Andrea Simich was the chair of the undergraduate program at Cornell. So we're talking about academia and having that focus. Misa Lund is here in Los Angeles. This part, um, at, at a certain point after we profiled people with uh, at different stages in their careers with different focuses, then we definitely wanted to make sure we had geographic diversity on the website. So Misa is based here in LA. Jenny and Andre French are in Boston. They're sisters that run a practice together. Kristen Becker is in Seattle, uh, Jennifer Bonner in Atlanta, Dorothy Mandrup in Copenhagen, Frida Escovedo is in Mexico, um, and Anna Luis Galindo is also in Mexico with her partner. Then we talked to folks like Kelsey Keith, who used to be the editor-in-chief of Curved and formerly an editor at Dwell, um, Architizer, so we focused on the media side of the profession. Same with Alexandra Lang, a critic, and having a critic's point of view on everything happening in the industry. Diana Darling founded the Architects newspaper with the late uh, Bill Manking. Sarah Sparer, this interview you have to all read because she was in uh, in-house counsel for SOM. She's a lawyer that uh, worked with architects, protected architects. Um, and for those of you that want to start your own firms, uh, I hope you've heard this before, but contracts and crafting your contracts and re reading your contracts is like, make it or break it so <laughs> definitely recommend reading this interview and she does give advice um you know what advice would she give for those entering the profession and starting their own firms from a legal counsel point of view sheila sogar is the ceo at big and other business of architecture perspective um anyway so now that i've shown you kind of the variety of uh people in terms of their um you know their uh timeline in the industry of their focus their geography we then thought, okay, we have all these women talking about their lives as a whole, so kind of this macro scale. Um, what is? How do they? How do they do it all? Um, and I know I don't. I don't like using that phrase because I don't believe everyone can do it all. I think <laughs> you can have different things at different times. Um, but we just wanted to see how people get it done, everything that they're doing in their lives, you know, in a scale of one day. So going from an entire lifetime of analysis or analyzing an entire lifetime of your work to um, just what is your day like on a daily basis. And so we've done that with some of the people that we've profiled previously. So Kristen in Seattle, this is her maker studio. Katie McDonald um, is working in Virginia with her partner, doing very interesting site-specific installations. And so how do they do that? How do they start a firm together? Jenny Payson, um, you know, continues her travel adventures with her babies. And we asked her how she did that. Um, Grit is really interesting. She works for um, a facade consultant now. She was an architect at SOM and moved on to this sort of focus. And so we asked her what her role entailed, what her day-to-day -day entailed. Mate is a curator now at the Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim Bilbao. Madeline Ringo is a really fun interior designer and working with all kinds of pop-up clients in the city. Yuri is a geologist in Los Angeles. Um, so she will go to sites and make sure that they are viable and uh, safe for development. So she gets hired by developers to literally go test the soil and the rock formations on the site, which is super interesting. Um, this is a young architect working for Olsen Kundig, and we talked about what her day was like. Another young architect, Stephanie from Rockwell Group, focusing on their lab, um, Rockwell Group Lab, Rockwell Lab. Brandt and Jerome had a firm, and Brandt stays with, is really interesting because she was very open about her um, fertility treatments, which was a huge part of her day, as you have to do multiple things throughout the day for it. Um, and it was just amazing to hear, you know, this, this kind of thing in these pieces of this is what I have to do in a day. Um, because I think you realize that in order to achieve some of these big milestones, like we talk about in the feature interviews, you have to do so much or so many important things during the day that people don't talk about and maybe don't seem like big things, but then they amount to big things and she now does have two happy children. <laughs> um, from there, so now I'm just talking about the evolution of all of our content verticals we started the expert and the expert was meant to be um, a place for women's essays on their work. And so we, you know, we talked about their lives in the feature interviews. We talked about how they get it done with um, in the scale of a day. But again, going back to this idea of 
women being asked often how they do it all and how they balance certain things. Um, we also wanted to reinforce that in addition to being really great um, like managers of time or um, being really great at managing their lives. These, the women that we were talking to and the people that were profiling are also experts on very technical and very specific things. And again, I think sometimes women in the industry, you often hear of how you know, there's no design principles at architecture firms. A lot of women are managing principles. We wanted to continue reinforcing that actually no, women have more of an expertise and always have had more of an expertise than the management of something. Um, so the expert was meant to be a place where people could write um, about their research interests, about their design interests, about their design research. And so Jenny and Onda French wrote about strange housing types and their focus on residential architecture. Katie McDonald wrote about bamboo as a building material. Um, oh gosh, this um, having an ESL moment. Um, mass timber, mass timber is the phrase I'm looking for. We had an essay on mass timber uh, and how it's gaining popularity as a sustainable building material and system. We had a preservationist write an, uh, an essay about preserving a really significant and old New York cathedral. We had someone else write about preserving stained glass pieces and you know how that works. Um, so these very like these are very very specific and very technical things, and we just loved that we had women associated with this kind of work and that women were writing about this work and doing it. Next Gen is where we decided to profile students. This came in the summer of 2020. I was heartbroken um, to see the situation that students were graduating into in May of 2020. And I felt responsible and I thought Madam Architect needed to do something. I didn't feel responsible for the situation, obviously, but I felt that Madam Architect needed to do something to um, support students, um, to show them, you know, to give them some hope for the future. And so we decided to celebrate students by profiling them in feature interviews as well. Um, so different students from different schools. I'll just flip through those. We don't have anyone from USC yet, I don't think. Uh, so faculty and staff, I'm looking for your recommendations for who we can profile and continue to profile. Um, but it's just really interesting to see different student work coming out of different schools. And some of these stories are amazing. And also I thought it was very interesting or very important to profile students because you are setting the tone for what the profession will be in you know, 10, 20 years. What you're learning now and what's like being put into your brain right now is going to be the foundation of everything you put out into the world in this field, I believe. I mean, that really starts from like probably early childhood, but uh, what's happening now is important too. And so I think it's really, really important to showcase, you know, what you're all thinking about and exploring right now in your careers is again, that will determine what we're going to see in the industry going forward. We also have Nina Cook-John who writes essays on identity for us. She has her own column. Um, and this is so interesting. I mean, she, like we wanted, to, we wanted someone to be a regular columnist for us that explored this idea of identity. And she writes about being an immigrant, about being a mother, about being an architect and a professor and an artist. Um, and I highly recommend everyone to look at her essays. This was an essay of hers about coming to New York. This was an essay of hers about her identity as an educator and this one as an artist. So again, I feel like oftentimes, um, you know, people think of themselves as architects, but um, there's a word multi-hyphenates. There's, I feel like more and more these days, people are talking about multi-hyphenates and people that do all kinds of things, then bring them together. And Nina is certainly one of them. I mean, I think as architects, we're all multi-hyphenates because architects need to synthesize so many different things. Um, but again, highly recommend for everyone to read Nina's essays. We also have a historical columnist on Madam Architect, I think is really interesting, again, for us to explore what's happening now in the industry, but also our foundations and where we came from. And there's a quote I heard um, that's something like, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I think, you know, we found that because when we think of feminism, it's had multiple waves, multiple um, kind of raising of consciousness and acceleration moments. And we wanted to see if this was the case for women in architecture, and it absolutely was. So our historical columnist, who's a preservationist, also working full-time, um, writes a column for us once a month, once every two months, on things like just general uh, history for women in architecture, on naming an architectural firm. H.C. Dozier probably doesn't scream women to anybody, and this is very intentional. I think uh, women early uh, on, when they were architects and in the field, um, didn't want to uh, didn't want people to know that they were women because they wanted to be hired. So uh, this is there's a really interesting essay on how they would name their firms and go about that. 
um, Black women in architecture and sort of that history. We have a column on the Lying In Hospital, which is a birthing hospital. Uh, Kate does a really amazing historical analysis of this, um, where women were basically like kept to recover after giving birth. And there's a whole analysis of that. Um, and the Beaux-Arts Ball and costumes and how that has uh, evolved through history and what we have now. So another really, really fun section. And actually for this column, we get a lot of people that are not in the industry writing to us and saying how they're really happy they found this. And um, because they think this is a historical column first and foremost. So history buffs really love it, but then it gets specific to architectural themes in the built environment. And finally, we have a critic too. And again, what I was saying earlier about Madame Architect really being a place for all kinds of perspectives from women. So we have the feature interviews, we have perspectives from the next generation, we have a historic historian writing for us. And this was a way for us to have someone that is female um, critique, you know, the way that architecture and design are communicated to the public. So Kate uh, reviews books, reviews exhibitions, uh, more exhibitions, shows, movies, you know, costumes, set decor, who are the people behind all of this, all of that. And finally, we do now interview more than women. Uh, in the summer of 2021, we did launch a column expanding the conversations where we did invite men to talk about some of the things that we ask women. And, th and this was interesting because I think some people, most of it was extremely positive, but some people were surprised that we're starting to feature men. But I think this is really important because ultimately it shouldn't be on the shoulders of women to support women's advancement in the industry, right? It's every, it's uh, up to everybody and it's up to all of us to support each other and ultimately build a better industry, a better world, better buildings. Um, and one thing that was also really important to me was the conversation happening uh, you know, a decade or so in Hollywood where women on the red carpet would, um, wouldn't want to be asked about what they were wearing because the men weren't being asked that. My personal opinion is that everyone should be asked who they're wearing and, you know, how they get ready because, um, I mean, it's the, the fashion designers that are creating these amazing outfits like need to be, need to have their work discussed. Um, but instead of not asking anyone anything, um, we should ask everyone the same questions and the same goes for things like parenthood, right? Women often get asked, how do you balance da da da? And men often don't. And I think you should ask men how they balance things, where they get the support, how, what fatherhood means to them. And so that's what we did in these interviews. Um, and so Kai Uwe, who's a partner of Big, did talk about fatherhood and the timing of when he decided to become a father. I mean, it's very pri privileged that he could decide when he became a dad, but um, we just found that these kinds of conversations weren't happening in design media with men. Um, Sean Joyner, who's here in Los Angeles, talked about his transition from being an architectural designer to a writer. Um, really, really amazing interview. He, he actually just had an essay go up today on the Architects newspaper that was wonderful. Kyle Schumann, um, whose partner I had talked about before, Katie McDonald, um, we talked about, you know, from his perspective, what it's like to start this firm, um, some of the loneliness he can experience and, uh, you know, having a focus that is maybe a little bit non-traditional and again, how to start a firm with his partner, how to support his partner, how they support each other. And very similar to Ryan Trinidad, Ryan got his master's in architecture and then went on to get another master's in real estate. And now he's in real estate working for Google and for YouTube within Google. And um, we get a lot, a lot of inquiries. And we've done interviews like this with women too, women that have transitioned from architecture to real estate. But um, it's a really interesting interview just to hear how people can do that and how he can do that. And again, his partner is also in real estate now, Tansy. They both met in architecture school, are both now in real estate, but doing slightly different things. And Again, we always ask, you know, um, we always ask everyone now how they support their partners and how they work together to build something. So how is all this possible? Uh, we do have a team of nine. Um, I've been doing this for five years, almost five years now. And after about a year and a half of doing it myself, not all of this myself, but I think I was doing feature interviews and the days with pieces on my own. Um, my hours are just completely unsustainable. They're still pretty intense now, but I've found ways I can tell you how it, I get asked a lot how I do this with my work at ENIAD and I'm happy to tell you about it. But at the time, before I got any help from Adam Architect, I was 
working at FX Collaborative, coming home, working at home, you know, staying up until uh, you know midnight or one in the morning. And I really don't like saying that because I do not condone or encourage this kind of effort. But I think sometimes this does need to happen just to push you into um, like a different sphere of things or a different level of things. And finally, Amy Stone, um, Who's, who's our senior editor now, she lives in Atlanta, wrote to me after hearing me speak at a very similar venue to this and just said, put me to work. I want to help. I want to be involved. And I was like, you are a godsend because I need help. And so Amy's doing interviews now, her own interviews. Um, and then we had Gail join us, another senior editor also doing interviews. Um, I'll, I'll finish with the team and then I'll talk about how we all can make it work. But Patrick Diamond also conducts interviews. Um, Kate Reggae is our historical columnist, like I mentioned. Kate Mazzeid, our critic. Nina Kirk John is an essayist for us. Sydney Nance is our communications and editorial assistant and helps us keep up the website. Um, and Julia Chu is our social media manager. And so on Instagram, it's still a lot of it is me and I'm I'm DMing on Instagram. So if you message the Instagram account for Madam Architect, I will respond, but Julia does the posts. And the thing about the team is that all of us have full-time jobs. Um, and so the the reason, I mean, the team is not that big and the nine people that you see here, really only six of us are full-time, if you will, or really only three of us are full-time. Um, and this is because, because we all are working, I wanted to make it so that everyone that was contributing could do a small chunk. So like Amy and Gail and Pat, they kind of do interviews when they want. Um, I don't feel like I can ask people to like do something for us at a certain cadence because we are still all volunteer run. Um, I'm working on that now to change it. Um, but media funding media companies I'm learning is a little bit complex. And we talk about architects, uh, you know, uh, not always being compensated, um, you know, to the amount that they should. And I think it's even, it's not even, it doesn't even compare to writers and journalists. So anyway, um, but we all do a little bit and, um, basically people contribute to the level that they want and that they're able to um but amazing team and amazing help and um i think we've really been able to expand some of our content verticals because we've had this help okay so now um i'd love to give all of you some deeper dives into profiles that we've done because i kind of touched on all the different things that we do but um what's been super interesting about these interviews is that they capture a moment in time, right? Even for the feature interviews, even someone that's looking back at her career, some of the first interviews we've done with you know, partners at firms, they've worked at like two other firms since then, and they were already at the top over here. And so these case studies I want to do for a few reasons. I want to show how a career can change over time and to encourage all of you that you know your first job that you get out of school will not be your forever job. It may be your forever job if you like it and if you, um, you know, evolve with it and keep learning, but there's all kinds of things you can do at all different times. And so uh, with that, I'll start with Farshid Musavi. Um, Farshid used to own a firm with Alejandro Zarapolo. They did the Yokohama Ferry Terminal that maybe many of you are familiar with. I use this as a precedent for my studio work all the time in, in school. Um, it was this, but this was, this is a really, um, an interview I really, really love because Again, by the time they had this firm, by the time they did this project, they had made it, right? Well, they ended up dissolving the firm. They were life partners as well and separated. Um, and first she'd started her own firm and had produced extremely significant architecture after that as well. So I think we talk a lot about constantly um, reinventing yourself, evolving, and how you can never know what the future holds for you. But as long um, as you can be adaptable and continue to be excited and stay curious, um, you know, you will continue to find success and uh, have meaningful impact. So I love her interview. I always use it as example, as an example. Suchi Reddy, um, her interview, I'm showing you all to um, demonstrate the different scales of work that you can have a, uh, a part in. So Suchi studied architecture, um, has lived in all kinds of different places and her mantra is form follows feeling. Um, she's very, very focused on lighting, conditions, materials, environments, and she does this, you know, with interior projects, but also installations, like this installation at Times Square, um, and I don't have images for it here, but she is focusing on much bigger projects now. She recently finished the Google headquarters that are in New York City, um, and it seems she's blowing up. She's everywhere in design media these days, and so I think 
first of all, her motto is very interesting, form follows feeling, but also how you can then translate that to so many different scales um, in so many different places. So I always recommend her interview for that. Jean Brownhill is one of the absolute smartest people I know. She is trained as an architect. Uh, she worked as an architect. Now she is the founder of a really successful tech startup. It's not a startup anymore. It's a robust um, company, but she founded a company called Sweeten, which uh, matches those looking to renovate their home and kind of lay people that are looking to do any, any sort of design work or architectural work with contractors and design professionals. Um, she started doing this out of her own home re renovation, which was very nightmarish. And she said, there just has to be an easier way to do this. I mean, I'm a design professional and I had a horrible time with this. So she launched Sweeten. Um, it is one of the very few uh, funded startups, like investment funded startups. Jean Brownhill is one of the few African-American women who has received significant venture funding. And just the company she's built is amazing. Um, so she's an amazing example of someone that has moved from architecture and who has worked in architecture, who's um, studied architecture, but now is bringing those skills to tech because really her, her focus now is a tech platform um, and how they're able to help people through technology. Kimberly Holden, another really interesting pivot story. She um, was a partner and one of the founders at Shop. You all know Shop. Um, she was one of the founders along with her husband at the time, another couple and the twin brother of the other couple. And um, she did that for 20 something years. Um, she had studied photography and dance in undergrad, got her architecture degree. And that was the wonderful thing about shop and the shop partners is they often talk about how they're all trained in something else besides architecture. And they always look for people when they hire people with a special secret sauce. And so Kim did this. Um, this is her other grandmother after shop won the PS1 competition really took off. And she talked about how um, when she had this firm, you know, she always had a lot of different interests. Again, a lot of people that work at shop do. And um, she had given birth to two daughters and both experiences she had were really, really wonderful, um, very luckily, um, but she had a doula and a midwife for both. And after the birth of her first daughter, again, the experience was so um, incredible for her in different ways and the professionals that she was working with that she said, you know what, I want to quit everything and I want to do this. I want to be, you know, um, a birth worker or um, a midwife or something. But then she said to herself, get a grip. You have this burgeoning firm. Um, you know, you're in it with your partners, your life, her life partner. Uh, we have to keep going. And then she had the same experience after the birth of her second daughter. Again, she was like, this is all I want to do. But oh my gosh, I have this firm that taking off how can I do that well after 20 years with shop um, she finally felt that it was time due to a series of personal and professional um, elements that she had done it uh, the wheels wouldn't fall off if she left shop she was um, kind of a in a managing role of uh, making sure the staff were well taken care of and I think once she felt that shop was in a really good place she could finally take time away from shop and do something that she wanted so she was she had done some traveling internationally and some volunteering with girls programs and she decided that she wanted to do something that helped women and girls specifically and became a birth and postpartum doula um, and it's really interesting how she talks about bringing a design education and design expertise to that um, similar in a similar way that Jean does with bringing it to tech. Um, for Kim, first of all, just the idea of pregnancy and the idea of birth is, um, I don't want to lighten it because I think it's a, a crazy, you know, intense experience and I haven't given birth, so I can't even really talk about that. But Kim talks about it as a design experience because your like movements that you can do to the baby influence um, how the birth process will go. And it's just, there is design involved in it. But beyond that, one thing she focuses on now is the design of birthing rooms and birthing floors. And she compares it to, um, I think in the United States, a lot of things tend to be very sterilized. And um, whereas she'll describe like birthing rooms she's seen in Copenhagen that look like yoga studios with like, you know, all kinds of equipment, all kinds of exercise equipment. And that was really eye-opening for her. So uh, she's working with women now. She set up her business, the skills with, of setting up a business that she learned from shop. Um, but now she's really focusing on taking her business to another level, which is um, beyond helping women get birth. It's also to design birthing environments and just the birthing process in general, which is very admirable. So again, you just, uh, no matter, you know, what you 
think you might want to do, or if you want to do something that seems completely different than architecture, I hope that interviews like um, Kim's and like Jean's give you an idea of how you can take what you're learning now and the way of thinking that you're learning now and apply it to whatever you want. Um, Sharon Prince, she is the founder of Grace Farms, um, which is the building designed by Sana in Connecticut. One thing we realized with Madam Architect is that it's really important for us to also feature clients. Um, I think there's a lot of conversations in the industry now of, you know, the value of architects and compensation and all of that. And I think the way we can begin to move the needle on that, I mean, it's a really, really, really long road ahead and just like the structural issues of who's financing our buildings and our architecture firms. I mean, it goes beyond real estate, beyond banking. It's like insane. Um, but I think to start moving the needle on it, you need to um, interview and talk to the people that are patrons of architecture, right, that are funding architecture, that are commissioning architecture, that are commissioning significant design. And so Sharon Prince is one of those people. Um, this is the building that I'm referring to by Sauna. It's the Grace Farms headquarters in um, Connecticut. Um, here she is with Andy Clemmer, who founded Paradise Projects, which is an owner's rep. I don't know how much or if at all you talk about owner's reps in school, but they are kind of um, in between architects and owners and or architects and real estate developers or any sort of client that's not super experienced in how to move through an architectural design and an architectural project, owners help them. And so Sharon enlisted Andy, who owns this firm, to help her find an architect, to help move the process. Um, and a lot of architects actually do that work too which we've profiled on the website. So one thing also I wanna encourage all of you is if you have any curiosity about any sort of um, like professional path or any sort of theme, just go on our website and search for it. And um, a lot of interviews that have that keyword will come up. So if you're interested in real estate, search for real estate. If you're interested in owner's rep, search for owner's rep and et cetera. But Shannon talked about, Sharon talked about um, hiring one architect first, they did a design, it did not work for them, and then they hired the owner's rep, they hired Sana. And so just this process also of selecting an architect for um, the commission and then working with them through the design process, I think is a really interesting thing for architects to read. Oh, there we go. Um, Sharon then also started Design for Freedom, which is an initiative out of Grace Farms to eradicate slavery within the built environment. There's still, um, there are still, you know, a lot of this going on all around the world. And so how do we, how do we eradicate it? Um, how do we make sure that our, the materials that we use that are sourced are sourced properly and um, kindly? And so this is really interesting to me that it's an, uh, kind of a non-industry professional and a not-for-profit owner that is leading this effort. And um, you can read about that too. And I'll end with Mariotti Blackwell from Harlem Blackwell Architects. Um, Mariotti, so this is another um, goal of mine with Madam Architect too, is to profile people that may not be the name on the door, but are, that are extremely crucial to the architecture practice. When I first started interviewing women, I think I interviewed like the secret wing of all of the firms, you know, Daniel Liebskin's firm has Carla Swickerath, who's now the CEO, who's extremely influential. Um, and Mariotti is uh, in a similar position with Marlon Blackwell Architects. Um, and, you know, super, super, super key to a lot of the projects. Um, but I haven't seen an interview with just her or even the two of them until we did an interview for Madam Architect. And so uh, Madam Architect has a lot of that too, of sort of the secret wing and, um, you know, people whose names we don't hear about. Um, and I think that's, I'll stop here. Um, so this is where you can find us for, if you don't follow us already, Madam Architect, I'm at Julia Gamalina. Hello at Madam Architect is where you can send us pitches or we prefer that you send us pitches there because that's where we collect them all. Um, and one thing, you know, we get loads and loads of pitches every day. And one thing that we say to everybody is that, um, we're very intentional about the combination of people in our monthly lineup. So for example, if we just profiled somebody working in housing in Georgia, we probably won't profile someone like that for a little bit. So if you pitch something to us ever and it's not now, that doesn't mean never. And we always keep track of everybody, um, everyone that's on our radar. And when whenever is a good time is when we profile folks. Um, but yeah, for any pitches, please email me there. Any questions that you might not be, um, you might be shy to ask in public, you can DM me or send us a note. We also have an ask the editor section in Madam Architect where we answer questions that we get here. 
Um, and they can be about anything. We answer questions on like, how do we make a portfolio that employers will, um, you know, will be intrigued by, or I'm mid-career and thinking of a pivot. How do I do that? So anything on your mind, you can definitely send to us there too. And I'll stop here. I'd love to open it to some questions. Thank you all for listening. I hope um, you all want to go home and research some things on Madam Architect after this. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me.